Contest at Law, Chapter 24 of Polygamy in the Bible, pages 248 to 268 program for Thursday, February the 24th, 2022 at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Guest call in number is 917-889-8827. Chat room and links to reading this chapter and book as well as listening online can be found at link below. Tub.com for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Since the time of Christ, perhaps nothing portrays the foolishness of man as vividly as his laws governing marriage. Numerous, inconsistent, and outright ridiculous marital laws have marred every era in history. Most of this legislation is bent towards superstition rather than practicality or divine law. Upon close examination, it will be observed that man's laws are always changing, but God's laws remain constant. This often causes a clash between civil and biblical law. But human legislators should have no more jurisdiction over marriage than they do over baptism or the Lord's Supper. Men might legislate laws contrary to the Ten Commandments if they wish, but that does not invalidate them, nor change God's sanction of them. Who would suppose that courts and congresses could assume the power to legislate against God's laws? Nevertheless, such tribunals have often enacted laws against God's laws of marriage. Civil authority has no jurisdiction over the freedom of conscience. Men are accountable to the dictates of their own conscience in moral and religious matters, for this is God's inalienable right to man. Men proclaim and subscribe to the separation of church and state, which means a church has no right to make laws to govern the state. But, conversely, it also means that the state has no right to govern or dictate laws governing a church or religion. Had the scriptures forbidden polygamy? All the human laws that could be enacted, could not make it lawful in the sight of God M- for that would place men above God. On the other hand, if God has not forbidden plural marriage, then all the men on earth even if joined with the angels in heaven, cannot make it sinful. Throughout history we have seen the flagrant abuse by both church and state in their making and enforcing unreasonable and outlandish laws. Suppose Abraham, Jacob or Moses lived in our contemporary society. Many of the Christian nations have laws that would put them in jail. But the real burlesque of modern churches is that they would have these men excommunicated. We live in a generation when men have enacted laws against plural marriage and dash but they rarely punish men or women for a dozen divorces, sexual seduction spawning illegitimate children, aborting babies, or whoredom. What an irony and dash we do not punish what God condemns, but we punish what God has commanded. The prime example, by the hands of men, administering civil law, Christ was condemned and crucified. Since polygamy seems to have been a popular type of marriage in biblical times, let us consider when monogamy was originally enforced as a law. Romulus, the founder of Rome, was the leader of a band of outlaws. After their ravaging and sacking the nearby communities, they hid in and among the hills of Rome. Eventually their numbers became so great that they wanted to become a community with wives. Since they had no women among them, they chose to catch the Sabine women who came to the river to bathe and wash clothes. After their successful rustling, they decided to make a law against any man having too many wives, while others had none at all. Lieutenant was called monogamy, and this is the first instance of any such law to enforce that system of marriage. But they also believed in divorce, and so it was not uncommon for Romans to have married a half dozen women in a half dozen years. This was tandem polygamy. Yet with all the power, size and dominion that the Roman Empire aspired to and attained, their marriage laws continued to be the same as they were with the little band of outlaws who first established them. 
Lieutenant is said that Julius Caesar attempted to have a law passed in favour of polygamy, but could not affect it. The Romans were too much opposed to the practices of the Jewish and Christian people to be persuaded to adopt it. The Roman government was monogamous, and therefore had an inescapable political pressure on the religion of the Christians. Christianity was not tolerated by Rome until Constantine, the Roman emperor in the 4th century, decided that all Romans should become Christians. He issued a decree that all Rome would be baptized Christians. Old, young, soldiers, criminals, etc., were all baptized, even though they were not converted. Lieutenant was a strange spectacle, but the Romans were not really made Christians. Christianity became Roman. Monogamy was not the only form of heresy that had been either forced or infiltrated into the Christian religion. As early as the first century, the doctrine of celibacy began to make inroads into Christianity also. Many Gnostic teachers of the first century, such as Simon Magus, Menorda, and Cerinthus, who all studied at Alexandria, later became Christians. They brought with them many of the Gnostic teachings which were infused into Christianity and then disseminated as Christian doctrine. Part of this heresy began in the first century, prevailing in the second century, and had permanently corrupted the church in the third and fourth centuries. Much of this Gnostic idealism came from some of the Persian or Magian systems of faith. Some of the early Gnostic Christians were Valentine, Montanus, Tudelian, and Originus as Saturninus in 115 had was advocating that the moral law was ascetic and severe and dash that celibacy was more pure than marriage. Another was Budessens, who wrote in 170 that the disciples of Christ would be closer to God if they would renounce wedlock, abstain from animal food, and live in solitude on the slightest and most meager diet and even to use water instead of wine in the Lord's Supper. Montanus, 175 ad, advocated that there should be no second marriages and chaste women should wear veils. His most distinguished disciple was Tadalian, Bishop of Carthage, whose voluminous works have been held in the greatest esteem. Origen, whose learning and numerous writings also had this same Gnostic influence was so devoted to it that he made a eunuch of himself. The first Platonic philosopher to join the Christians was Justin Martyr, who was beheaded in Rome in 155 but his followers tried to harmonize the philosophy of Plato with Gnostics through Christianity. This medium of faith was called the New Platonism. Those involved formed the ideology that those individuals who seek for a higher sanctity should mortify the flesh by avoiding marriage and all indulgences of the senses. From out of the confusing changes came the austere religious hermits, celibate priests, monks and nuns. By 314 and in the Council of Caesarea, it was decided that if a priest should marry after his ordination, he must be released from his office. This was written into their first canon of scripture. The seventh canon forbid a priest to even be present at the marriage of a bigamist. In the fourth century a sect called the Severians was so pious they said, woman was the work of Satan, and marriage is diabolical. Their laws were all bent on celibacy, which in turn lead to their own extinction. But the doctrine of celibacy was not entirely stamped out. The Valesians believed that merely restraining themselves from women was not enough. They administered laws that required themselves to be castrated. They were convinced that none but eunuchs could be saved in the kingdom of heaven. These are the same people who have changed many of the doctrines and laws of God, such as baptism and dash once submerged in a river, was transformed into a pouring, dipping, or sprinkling. All attended with a long ceremony, rites and words, signs of the cross, exorcism, salt and sureties with godfathers and godmothers. 
sacrament and dash a simple supper of bread and wine, transformed into wafers, robes, liturgies, transubstantiations of the actual blood and flesh of Christ, to be worshipped and eaten. Marriage and dash simple order of matrimony became a spectacle not unlike a circus, with a host of traditional regulations and legal obligations. Out of this acquisition of peculiar converts, came the new leaders. Their interpretation and understanding soon became law. Their decrees postulated the doctrine that polygamy was acceptable up to about 30 ed, but after 33 ed it was a sin. The curious idea that something could be virtuous, holy and acceptable to God for 4,000 years and then suddenly become immoral, unholy and condemned by the Lord, was enough to make anyone question their doctrine as well as their leadership. Even though God said, I am the Lord, I changed not. These new shepherds said he did. All the Bible commentators say that the laws of God are unchangeable, perpetual and perfect, and they agree that the commandments of God to Moses were not changed by Jesus. Yet ministers of today, like the pagan philosophers of Rome, say that they were. Martin Luther mentioned the plausibility of plural marriage in a sermon at Wittenberg in 1522. It was not a hasty statement or conclusion, but one that resulted from a great deal of study in the scriptures. Eighteen years after giving this sermon, he performed a plural marriage to Prince Philip of Hesse. It seems that Philip's wife was either incapable or refused to bear him a son that would inherit his name on his throne. He appealed to Martin Luther for an answer to the problem suggesting that since divorce was wrong perhaps taking a second wife was not. Luther and his colleagues wrote him a reply. XXI But after all, if your highness is fully resolved to marry a second wife, we judge it ought to be done secretly, as we have said with respect to the dispensation demanded on the same account, that is, that none but the person you shall wed, and a few trusty persons, know of the matter, and they, too, obliged to secrecy under the seal of confession. Hence no contradiction nor scandal of moment need be apprehended. For it is no extraordinary thing for princes to keep concubines. And though the vulgar should be scandalized thereat, the more intelligent would doubt of the truth, and prudent persons would approve of this moderate kind of life, preferable to adultery and other brutal actions. There is no need of being much concerned for what men will say, provided all goes right with conscience. So far do we approve it, and in those circumstances only by as specified. For the gospel hath neither recalled nor forbid what was permitted in the law of Moses with respect to marriage. Jesus Christ has not changed the external economy, but let it justice only and life everlasting for reward. He teaches the true way of obeying God, and endeavors to repair the corruption of nature. Your Highness hath therefore, in this writing, not only the approbation of us all, in case of necessity, concerning what you desire, but also the reflections we have made thereupon. We beseech you to weigh them, as becoming a virtuous, wise, and Christian prince. We also beg of God to direct all for his glory and your highness's salvation. May God preserve your highness. We are most ready to serve your highness given at Wittenberg the Wednesday after the feast of St. Nicholas, 1539. Your highness is most humble and most obedient subjects and servants. Martin Luther. Philip Melanchthon. Martin Busser. Anthony Corvin. Adam. John Leving. Justice Wind 30. Dennis Melantha. From History of the Variations of the Protestant Churches, Volume 1, by James Benign Beaujuit. All went well with the new marriage until Philip's new mother-in-law decided that it was either too wonderful or too terrible to be kept a secret. Pandemonium wasn't the only thing to fall on Luther's head and he resolved that society wasn't quite ready for these pearls from the Bible. 
he concluded that if anyone else wanted to be united in plural marriage, they would have better success in asking someone other than himself to perform the ceremony. The founder of the Church of England was also a polygamist. This was King Henry VIII, who has been married for nearly 20 years to Catherine of Aragon. But then he fell deeply in love with Anne Boleyn. Finally in the year 1532 he was privately married to her, and like that of the German prince, it was done in a secret ceremony. The Roman Church had instilled a fear to make people believe that polygamy was unchristian. So those who didn't believe their doctrine were under the painful necessity of keeping their plural marriages secret. But King Henry was always under the fear of having trouble with society and with the church, so he sought for a divorce from his first wife. But the church would not sanction it, whereupon the king pronounced himself the head of the church in England. The Church of England now had for its founder a polygamist. It is evident that the majority of the people did not consider polygamy an issue, because they acknowledged him as the head of their church over the celibate Pope of Rome. The twenty-year marriage, which had resulting children, was dissolved by divorce through an act of parliament and was considered null and void and of no effect. But twenty years later by similar act it was considered accepted to stand with God's law, valid and to all intents and purposes. This royal king and priest had a total of eight marriages before his life concluded. In 1539 anyone who denied the law of transubstantiation, sacrament of Lord's Supper becoming the actual body of Christ, was a heretic, and the offender was to be burned to death and a forfeit, as in cases of high treason. In the year 1547, it was all repealed and set aside. In 1553 Queen Mary came to the throne and all was revived again. Hundreds were burned alive. In 1562 this doctrine was abolished and said to be unprovable by holy writ and repugnant to the plain words of scripture. God could not be of one mind during the reign of Henry, another at the time of Queen Mary, and then another with Elizabeth. Neither can God be so variable as to be one thing with Moses, another with Christ, and still otherwise with men after them. The word of God stands through time as always and dash the word of God. God never meant his works for man to mend, said Dryden. Napoleon Bonaparte wanted children and especially an heir, but Josephine could have none. She was a virtuous noble woman but the only alternative was to divorce her so that he could marry another. The reasons for the divorce were announced, but it was the turning point in his career. From this time on, his life became a disaster. As one author said, One cannot, even now, after so long a time, contemplate the tears of Josephine and the subsequent disasters of Napoleon, without cursing the narrow bigotry of monogamy and wishing that the golden age of polygamy had returned before his day. History and Philosophy of Marriage, Campbell, p. 193. The history of the Jewish nation also reached a climactic point during these dark ages. Polygamy was once a law and considered as such, but today it is different. Some Jewish narrators are inclined to believe that the polygamous marriages of some of the patriarchs need excuse and apology, while others accept it as an ancient law and even practice polygamy today. The famous scholar and historian, Flavius Josephus, has been named among the Jewish polygamists. It is not known how many wives he had, but the Jewish scholar, Dr. Irving H. Cohen, acknowledged that Josephus had one wife in Palestine and another in Egypt. Justin Martyr asserted that during his time in the second century, the Jews were permitted to have four to five wives. The scholars of Jewish history acknowledge that N- among the judges, however, polygamy was practiced, as it was also among the rich and the nobility. 
conflicts of the law were confusing. Jewish law reached the Middle Ages with polygamy permitted, but not much practiced. In the codification of the Jewish law, Mamonides, Yud, Ishut 14, makes it lawful for man to contract many simultaneous marriages. However, an express prohibition against polygamy was pronounced by R. Jashom B. Judah, which was soon accepted in all the communities of northern France and of Germany. Some authorities suggested that R. Jashom's decree was to be enforced for a time only, namely, up to 1240, probably believing that the Messiah would appear before that time. The Jews of Spain practiced polygamy as late as the 14th century. The Spanish Jews, as well as their brethren in Italy and in the Orient, soon gave up these practices. And today, but few cases of polygamy are found among them. In 1843, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, proclaimed the validity of the Bible and God's sanction of the doctrine of having many wives and concubines. He, too, was under the necessity of practicing polygamy in secrecy because of the superstitious and prejudiced minds of his time. But by 1852 the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints accepted the doctrine and publicly announced it nationwide. As a rather humorous sidelight, the famous midget Tom Thumb went to visit Brigham Young, saying that he didn't understand the principle of polygamy. Brigham replied, Well, Tom, when I was your size, I didn't understand it either. And not even too many Mormons understood it and dash only from 3% to 18% ever practiced polygamy at any one time during its 38-year history in the LDS Church. However, some of the Mormons, including the widow of Joseph Smith, organized a church of their own in 1862, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mostly because they did not believe or accept the doctrine of polygamy. Yet on April 14, 1972, they accepted a ruling that would permit polygamists to join their church. Here is the unbelievable paradox of Mormonism. One church initially and vehemently rejected polygamy, but later accepted polygamists into their church. The other adopted polygamy as a tenet of their faith and members suffered persecution, prison and even death to defend it, then within a few years they rejected it and anyone who advocated or practiced it would be excommunicated. Our founding fathers bequeathed to this nation a document establishing freedom and dash assuring its citizens the freedom of conscience, religion, and personal privacy against big government interference. Those patriots spilled their blood to preserve this constitution, and inalienable rights became a sacred trust. However, wicked men soon got into office, swearing to defend that constitution, but forming laws directly contradictory to it. Why have the laws of God been changed? because men have adopted their own superstitions and prejudices in preference to God's inalienable rights to man. For instance, here are some superstitions of our time that have changed the laws of God. 1. Human law can supersede divine law. Man has made, and usually does make, laws which are contrary to those of God. 2. Marriages are not binding unless civil authority approves. Customs, regulations and courts can overturn the moral code of laws which God has established. 3. Women may be seduced and rejected without any legal recourse. Unless a state approved a ceremony is performed, there is little legal claim. If a child is conceived, a state-approved abortion may be performed with state tax money. 4. Prostitution can be and often is legal. Licenses, medical checks, permits and income tax from prostitution are part of our tradition, and often countenanced, if not practiced, by civil authority. 5. 
Polygamy was lived in the Old Testament, but done away in the New Testament. This is part of the unscriptural traditions that have more validity than the Bible. 6. Polygamy is a crime. Polygamy was lived by the most recognized men of God in the Bible, but it is outlawed by many civil legislators. 7. Jesus was a bachelor. Most ministers believe that Jesus was too holy to be married, or else marriage was too unholy for Jesus. They suppose that the law of increase was God given for everyone and everything but Jesus was exempt from that law. 8. Polygamy is a sin equal to adultery. Nowhere in the Bible can such a ridiculous absurdity be supported, but our modern preachers say so. 9. Polygamy today cannot have religious sanction. Polygamists found in Catholic, Protestant or Mormon churches are quickly excommunicated. Abraham, Jacob, David, Moses, Joseph Smith and a host of other prophets would not find fellowship in the churches of today. 10. The Gospel Can Change Men have changed the Gospel and intend to change it more as they progress with civil regulations, customs and the voice of the people. God said his blessings are always predicated upon specific laws. Mankind intend to get the same blessings regardless of what laws they obey. As a result of man's superstitions and prejudices, let's compare the laws of God to those of man. 1. God said to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis man says we must control births. The earth has too many people on it now. 2. God said that if a man should entice a maid and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. Man must seduce a hundred girls as a sport, and he surely need not endow them as wives. 3. When a man has had carnal knowledge of a woman, he may not put her away all his days. Man says that he can put away as many wives as he marries and dash all legally if he can afford to pay the court. 4. God says that when a woman is joined to a man, they shall be one body and one flesh. Genesis man says that only the civil courts have a legal right to make a man and woman united. 5. God said that if a man have two wives, that he must treat them equally in his inheritances. If a man have two wives, the second marriage is null and void. He surely shall not have two wives, nor equally support them. 6. If a man and woman commit adultery, they shall be put to death. Adultery is popular. House key exchanges are modern games. They shall not be put to death. 7. God said there shall be no whores among the daughters of Israel the whore shall die. Man says that prostitutes shall not die, but they shall be paid richly and given the finest clothes, cars, apartments, licenses, and shall be highly respected as a necessity to the community. In 1862 the United States passed an anti-bigamy law. It would disincorporate a church practicing polygamy and limit their amount of real estate to $50,000. Any value to exceed that would be forfeited to the United States government. This act was to curb polygamists from owning property through theocratic institutions inconsistent with our form of government. In March 1882 they passed the Edmonds Act, named for Senator George F. Edmonds of Vermont. This provided for a fine not to exceed $300 and imprisonment not to exceed six months, or both if found guilty of having a polygamous wife. It also declared any person living polygamy incompetent for jury service. Furthermore, it declared any person in polygamy ineligible for public office.
This act became so flagrant as to impose the interpretation that any person professing even a belief in polygamy as a religious principle, was considered ineligible to vote or hold public office. A commission appointed by the federal government in Utah declared that in the first year after this bill was passed, 12,000 men and women were excluded from registration and voting. Anyone who would not deny the charge of polygamy was considered guilty. On February 19, 1887, another amendment known as the Edmonds Tucker Act was made a law, without the signature of President Cleveland. The Attorney General proceeded to confiscate both real and personal property of the Mormon Church. This act abolished territorial women's suffrage, disinherited children born in plural marriage, prescribed a comprehensive test oath for polygamists to sign or they would be unable to vote, hold office, or serve on juries. The act also required all marriages to be certified in the probate courts. The act eventually led to the confiscation of over $1 million in property and cash from the Mormon Church. These and other interpretations against polygamy were upheld by the Supreme Court. It is ironical that at the time these laws were being enacted against polygamists, prostitutes were swarming around Washington, D.C., like bees around a hive. Furthermore, many congressmen were bestowing gifts upon these harlots while making such unconstitutional laws. If God would have given a law against plurality of wives as he did against the plurality of husbands, then the matter would have been settled. He clearly stated that anyone with plural husbands should be stoned to death. But with plural wives, he honored the men, the wives, and the children, adding blessings and promises, and continuing his communication with them. Thus the difference between the laws of God and those of men. Any qualified lawyer who understands law will admit that there must be a review of the whole law to determine the meaning of any statute in the law. Thus, any sentence in the Bible having a doubtful or questionable meaning must be compared to all the law that has been given on that subject. The Mosaic law is referred to over 200 times in the New Testament and in not one instance was it criticized or considered obsolete or changed. If you take a watch or an engine with cogs, wheels, shafts and gears, and remove one part, it will throw the whole works into disorder. So it is with the laws established by Moses. This is why the Saviour said that not one jot or tittle would be removed. To judge a law properly, we can do as Jesus said and look at its fruits. Our complicated system of lawyer craft and civil madness that fills our courts with marriage and divorce legislation and litigation, could only be the propagation of Satan himself. But let's briefly consider the fruits of both monogamy and polygamy. The fruits of monogamy, adultery and homosexuality are becoming commonplace. Prostitution thrives as one of the biggest industries of our society. Venereal disease has reached epidemic proportions. Depopulation and sterility are the natural results of prostitutes and their patrons. Sex and sensualism have entered the schools, pornographic magazines, movies, and they are creating a people described by Jeremia, they were as fed horses in the morning. Everyone ate after his neighbor's wife. Their illicit affairs have made a rich industry of contraceptives and medical sterility. Divorce and remarriage are popular with many people, causing children, if they are allowed to be born, confusion as to who their parents are. The fruits of polygamy Polygamy is a written law of God and given by heavenly instruction. It is moral and has been honored by God's people for thousands of years. It gives a woman the chance to marry the man she wants. It provides a man with children if his first wife is barren. It stops prostitution. Men who can provide for a large family have the opportunity to do so. A woman may be one of several wives, 
Yet she enjoys more freedom and more right to choose her kind of work or where to spend her time than a monogamous wife. The resulting children can play at home in a controlled atmosphere with their brothers and sisters, rather than having to choose their friends from among the Gentiles. Summary with all of the legal confusion, pagan traditions and warped morality of our generation, it is no wonder that the devil and his imps are able to rule over modern Christianity. Our civilized society has produced a world filled with crime, whoredom, illegitimate children, and venereal diseases and ash bulging the walls of our prisons and insane asylums. We are suffering from broken homes, aborted children, atheism, divorce, and homosexuality. The reasons are simple. We have invented laws and regulations opposed to those which God has given. The prophet Daniel said that in the last days the devil would have power over men to speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Jesus contended against the same evils by saying, that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. But the evils in Jesus' day were not as wicked as they are in our time. We have sophisticated crime. We have hid state and federal laws to legalize iniquity and punish men for obeying God. We have gathered together the wickedness of all the corrupt ancient nations by incorporating 1. The immorality of Babylon, 2. The marriage laws of Rome, 3. The conniving money manipulations of the Pharisees, and 4. The atheistic educational systems of the pagans. Yet we have the audacity to boast of our advanced lawful and civilized society. Chapter 25 Rules of Conduct